when Jesus turned and saw them following him, he said, what are you looking for? Let us pray. And now, O oh Lord, speak to us as your word is proclaimed that you might, that we might hear your call and respond with glad and joyful hearts through Christ our Lord. Amen. I have this lady that lives in my cell phone. Her name is Siri. Maybe you've met her. Ordinarily, she's very, very helpful. Helps me to arrive at my destination, helps me to find information, provided that I don't let my battery get charged too low, but because then she vanishes, just disappears. No Siri, nowhere when that happens. But again, the vast majority of the time, she's very, very helpful. But here's what I've noticed. If I ask her, a question of, of a personal nature, she can get very guarded and very reserved. And sometimes she will even say in her mechanical little voice, oh, no, Craig, this is not about me. It's about you. Has anybody else tried to ask her a personal question? She doesn't dig that too much. Well, there is a person in our text who makes that same sort of statement. It's not about me. You know, throughout history and in, in literature and artwork, as we saw in our graphic just a minute ago in the Bible, John the Baptist is always depicted as pointing away from himself and towards Jesus. And yet, that being said, we can't seem to get rid of the guy. He's like that cat that just keeps jumping on your lap and you set him down 20 times and he keeps jumping back up. But you know, the, the beginning of the season of Advent, as we look forward to the coming of the baby, who do we meet in the beginning of that season? A scraggly old preacher out in the desert, John the Baptist. And then Christmas Eve night, we hear those words, there was one, there was a man sent from God whose name was, and you expect the writer to say Jesus, except he doesn't. He says John. There was a man who came from God whose name was John. And then Epiphany, we run into John the Baptist. Last week, baptism of the Lord's day, who baptized the Lord? John the Baptist. And then today, as Jesus begins his formal ministry, we have this image of John pointing his disciples away from himself and to Jesus saying, Behold, the Lamb of God. This is the one I was preaching about. This is the one I was telling you about. And Jesus doesn't argue, does he? And it doesn't seem to take his disciples long to drop him and start following Jesus either, does he? Well, notice, notice what Jesus does as he begins his public ministry in, in a formal way. You might expect, being the greatest preacher ever, you might expect that he would begin his ministry with a sermon. But he doesn't. You might begin, think that he would begin his ministry with a public lecture on theology, epistemology, or Christology, but he doesn't. You might think he would start his ministry with a lesson on the Bible, but he doesn't. What does he do in our text this morning? He asks a question. He asks a question to those who would be his followers. Guys, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? And it's not like they've lost their car keys and they're out in the desert looking under rocks. It's, what he's saying is, 
What are the most important desires? What, is the, what are the deepest desires of your heart? And because that kind of conversation takes a long time, they spent the afternoon together. After um, Andrew, being the most evangelical of the bunch, goes and gets his brother, Simon Peter. They spend that afternoon together, and they spend, David, many other afternoons and evenings and days together because what they discovered was that Jesus is who they were looking for. And it all began with that question. Conrad Gimp is a New Testament scholar in, in Scotland who has written a book called Jesus Asks. And, he, and he's identified 67 episodes of, of dialogue with Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. And that in 50 of those conversations, 50 of the 67, Jesus asks a question. Why is it that Jesus, this one who has everything to teach us, everything to tell us, asks so many questions? Well, the short answer might be because he's Jewish. It's just kind of a Jewish thing. The slightly longer answer might be because he's a Jewish rabbi. Woody Allen once asked his rabbi, why is it? You rabbis always answer a question with a question. His rabbi thought a minute and said, why shouldn't a rabbi always answer a question with a question? Edgar Schein, who is a um, professor, senior, senior professor at the School of Management of MIT has written a book called Humble Inquiry, great book that's out now on leadership. And in that book, he explains why it is important to ask questions. It can save your career, it can save your marriage, it can save your life sometimes, literally or the life of somebody else, if you're a surgeon, if you're a doctor, or if you're a firefighter, if you're a police officer. Asking questions can literally save your life. And what I thought was interesting is that while Shine does not quote Jesus one time in the book, at least I've read about three quarters of it, I haven't seen him do that yet, and I've looked, sort of looked through it. But even though he doesn't quote Jesus one time, basically what he's saying is a series of footnotes on Jesus' leadership and ministry style. It's been done before, about 2,000 years ago. Jesus asks questions because it's the only way to really get to know people, and Jesus wants to get to know people. Without saying to someone, Tell me about yourself. And then listening, you're not really going to get to know them. Asking questions, asking questions can help us to get to know people and, and, and can help us in ways that, that just offering pat, simplistic answers never can. And not only that, sometimes offering those pat, simplistic answers just sucks the mystery out of life until it's just flat and dead. But think of it like this. Let's say that you've got a child who comes to you and says, Mom, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, they're doing their homework. What is four plus four? What do you do? Do you say eight and then hope you can go back to your iPad or your newspaper? Not, that's not very advisable, is it? What if you ask, what if you tell the child who asks you what is four plus four is eight, what is that child going to do? In about one second, nanosecond, 
Mom, dad, what's four plus five, right? What's, that's just a pat answer. Now, if you help the child by helping them learn other questions, that can get to the answer. Jesus asks questions to get to know people and because it helps us to learn and grow. Jesus asks questions because it helps us to learn and grow and because, um, and because he loves us. I saw a, a, a YouTube video recently with Conrad Gimp, who wrote the book on the Gospel of Mark, and he explained the reason why he, he studied the Gospel of Mark for his book was because it was the shortest. And the truth is, if he had gone to Matthew, if he had gone to Luke, he would have had a lot more questions that Jesus asked. Now, John's a bit of an exception, but it is interesting that John begins his ministry with, with Jesus asking a question. Throughout, throughout the New Testament, you have Jesus asking these questions. What is the most important commandment? Do you love me? Are you going to abandon me too? Can you love God who you have never seen if you don't love your neighbor who you have seen? Jesus asks questions because it helps us to grow, helps us to learn because he wants to get to know us and because he loves us. Matt Merlette last week um, challenged us to honor God and one another with our presence in church attendance. And I would just like to follow up his remarks by saying, Amen. And well said. And I've thought too how it might be helpful. To, to offer a grading system for you. It could work like this. If you plan to attend church 90% of the time or more this coming year, 2014, give yourself an A. By the way, raise your hand if you think you attended church 90% of the time last, last year. Anybody? That's pretty encouraging, isn't it? So, do it again. Okay. If you think you're, you will attend church 80% or more next year, give yourself a B. Then, let's grade on a curve. All right? Let's say you plan to be here at least half the time, strong C, all right? And anything less than that, I'll let you grade your own paper. Now, I know people have to work. Sherry, that's an excused absence, particularly if I'm the one in the accident that you have to, you know, take care of. That's, that's an excused absence when, when you have to work. People have aging parents they have to care for. Sometimes you have to miss. A, you know, you can't, really, you can't really assign a grade for church attendance. I understand that. But gathering together for worship is really important. As the book of Hebrews tells us, forsake not the assembling together of yourselves. It's the place where we hear those important questions. It's the place where Jesus promises to be with us in special ways. Where two or three or, or more are gathered in my name, there I will be. In this bread, in this cup, you will experience my grace and my life and my presence and church is the place where we hear that question, as in our text today, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? As the whole time Jesus is still hoping that our answer will be, it's you. It's you, O oh Lord, that I am looking for. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen.